So I worked in this upstairs studio that was a dress shop in the night. I think it was like 1912 called the, I think it was called the Watson's Dress Shop. And it had hardwood floors. I think it was like 1,200 feet, uh, square feet or whatever. It's huge. It was a dance studio at one point. It had a big um, mirror on the far end. And I was in heaven because I had, I had five glorious windows. And I could stand at the window, look down at Main Street, watch people going by. And I got the apartment across the street. So I used to say I could have a zip line. I could just go back and forth to work. There was a bookstore, there was a coffee shop, Mm -hmm. and there was a bar. What else could you need? You know, it's been so long that I've done these in-house. They've almost always been on Zoom for the last year. So it feels, you know, this used to be it. I've been doing this podcast for three years. Oh, my goodness. And having, uh, (laughs) having... actual humans close to me <laughs> is like oh we have to do this again yeah. yeah we've both been vaccinated i'll look at the camera she can look yes. at it we've both been vaccinated fully vaccinated so mm. we can now uh, pretend to uh be back to normal are we back to normal I, it's kind of getting getting there i think people are becoming more comfortable being out and about and i think i find myself kind of having daydreams about things that i miss that i would like to do eventually like you know Going to the movies, believe it or yeah, not. Yeah, no, I haven't been either. Going to a movie theater and seeing, you know, big screen. I'm really, I love movies. So yeah. I love going in and just being in the whole theater, the popcorn, the beer, whatever you're doing and having the whole experience. Yeah, like, what's that movie theater? I, I've gone to it a bunch of times. That's down, um, it's the little theater that uh, shows um, the more offbeat movies in Santa Fe. Oh, yeah, John Cup. Ch- Co- John Cocteau, Cocteau right? yeah. yes, it's that's R- a great one. Is, is it, it's probably close, right? Yes, it is. It's R.R. R. Martin. Yeah, know. he owns it, right? He owns it. Yeah, I, I went and saw High Noon there and bought all his books <gasps> oh, yeah. for my son's uh, Christmas gift. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is a fun. But yeah, so yeah. I guess he can probably afford to, to weather the thing. Is it open yet? Um, I, I think it's just like they're doing like online some streaming from some of the movies that they've they're mm-hmm. involved in uh, there's an independent film festival going on at some point but i think it's all online i'm not really sure about mm. that but i do know his latest project is really exciting they bought the lamey railroad oh they did yeah there was like wow. two other people there's like three partners in the lamey railroad in lamey which is this fabulous pit place and um it's out near galisteo where i used right. to live right and they're going to restore the railroad and it's going to be some kind of i don't know themed historically hmm. themed oh thing. that's interesting yeah, and, it, and, pub and all that the railroad still go through it yes it does yeah and then from where does it go from there though it goes all the way to i think it's la it does go all the way mm-hmm. to la i have a story about that because i used to live in galisteo so the lamy railroad the railroad going from lamy used to actually go near my house and i had hmm. horses and so I used to go out there with my horse, and I could go under the railroad track. It was a very narrow tunnel. In fact, you have to lay down on the back of your horse. Mm. And if your horse, I mean, you trust your horse. If your horse bucked or if your horse did anything, yeah, you're, d- you're, you're, you're gone. Right. And so I'd come out <laughs> on the other side and hear the train coming, and I would race the lamey train. Oh, my God. So all of a sudden, this as a passenger train, <laughs> these people would be like, oh, this is the Wild oh. West. And then they'd look out the window, and you could see them going like this, look, look. <laughs> And there's a woman on a, on a paint horse yeah. racing the train. With or without saddle? <laughs> <laughs> I prefer with saddle. Yeah. yeah. And so would you like really kick it? I mean, go Oh, full. yeah. We're galloping. Oh, wow. We'd la- race the lamey train. Yeah. Uh-huh. My horse was scared of a, a, a black, he would be scared of a black um, sack. Yeah. You know, our black jacket would send him off spooked. But the train, Didn't they blow the he horn. Knew, he knew what it was doing. And they would blow the horn? Yeah, they blow the horn, and the horse is just fine. Could go right by his head, and he was so, <laughs> he was into it. <laughs> oh, man. It, it, but you can't do that anymore, I guess, because you don't live out there? In not yeah. living in Galisteo. Okay. No horse? I, I do horses, but... Um, not that horse? Not that horse. I ride in uh, the north part of town now in a place called Nambe. Yeah. So I'm from New Mexico. Oh, that's so, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I've heard of Mom Day, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I ride up there. There's a show barn, and I dabble around with hunter jumpers. Oh, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Well, that kind of brings us, first of all, by the way, Kat, we have Catherine Stedham here. Uh, we just kind of started off our podcast without even doing anything else. No real introductions. But <laughs> she's a wonderful artist that I don't represent, but you can find at Blue Rain Gallery. And where else? Your website, I assume? 
Well, right now, Blue Rain Gallery. Yeah, okay. So there, if you want to see your work, it's at Blue Rain. And uh, it's uh, it's very interesting. You have a, uh, you know, it reminds me, by the way, a little bit, and I wanted to get into this, uh, Louisa McElwain. There's a sense of that. Hmm. Is, is, do, do you have any connection with her work at all? Yeah. Or uh, her? That's interesting. I've heard, I've actually heard that before. And um, I not really, I didn't, I didn't meet her, but I, we've been in each other's periphery for years. Mm. And I guess, you know, there's probably an association there in terms of people think of her work as powerful and, you know, it ha- it's large scale. And mm-hmm. I used to paint really large scale myself, mm. eight foot, six foot, 10 foot oh, paintings. Wow. And so thank you for that comparison. Cause, um, you know, it's, she's, she's associated with really powerful work. Yeah. So, but I never met her and I think my work is, we, we kind of seem to uh, have some of the same haunts in terms of where we painted. I think yeah, that's a, part of it. I think a same, it's a little deeper even than that. I mean, I represented her for 20 years hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> I just see a correlation. I don't know what it is, but, yeah. and it may be just the emotion, Yeah. you know, cause I mean, when you look at her paintings, they're emotionally driven. Yeah, they are. I think um, I think of it as also the physicality. You know, when you work big like that, and she's also working, it's very immediate. And I mm. think maybe that's the association also. I'm very concerned with being very immediate. That's it. That's so, the answer. Yeah. That's it. A la prima. Yeah, because that's how she painted. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I knew there was something there. <laughs> you were onto it. <laughs> I, I've been doing this for long enough to actually be able to observe some things. Mm. So tell me a little bit about you, because I really, you know, I've, I've tried to avoid any, you know, you've done a podcast with Leroy on his new uh, mm-hmm. podcast, which I'll give a shout out to uh, Leroy. You can hear this, uh, her speaking in, on his podcast. But I particularly avoided that because I just wanted to be a fresh slate to know what was going on. So where, because you do not have a New Mexico accent, that I know. <laughs> but what is that ac- accent and where did you grow up? <laughs> yeah, so I, I grew up in Virginia, uh-huh. actually coastal Virginia. Uh-huh. So we call it the Mid-Atlantic Atlantic area. Uh-huh. I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia on the ocean. Oh, that's beautiful though. Yeah, so I grew up sailing. I actually lived on boats growing up. You mean as your family lived on boats? Mm-hmm. They didn't have a house at a boat? Yes. Was it a sailboat or a houseboat? or Big sailboat. Oh, that's interesting. So I started sailing when I was three years old. And my parents were really big into it. My dad had a bunch of motorcycles. My mother was not having any part of it because she says, I can't do that with you. And he wanted a little sailboat because he was a big, um, he was a surfer and a diver. And he saw a sailboat. My mother says, tell you what, if you buy that sailboat, I'll go with you. And mm-hmm. the rest is history. They've been sailing. They, they've sailed their entire lives. Wow. I've sailed my entire life. And you have kids? Uh, you have your uh, brothers or sisters at all? Yeah, I have one sister. She's yeah. two years younger. Yeah, and so you guys grew literally grew up in the sailboat. You didn't have a house. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's... Well, I mean, at certain points we had a house, but for the most part of my, probably from my teenage years up, we worked to, up until that point. It was kind of like my parents' dream. And so at a certain point we got the boat and the house went away and we were told this is going to be your life. And so, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a good life. It was very interesting to grow. I didn't think of it as any different because I've been around boats my whole life. Yeah. So, and so you had it moored in the Harbor and one of the harbors in Mm -hmm. in Virginia. Uh Yeah. It was, it was docked in what's called Little Creek in Norfolk. Yeah. So I went to school like a regular kid when we weren't going to school or in the summers, we were off cruising so uh, myself, as an adult, I own several boats. So I kind of took it over as my own passion later in life. In fact, um, in 1999, I sailed 1,000 miles by myself from Virginia to Florida. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, how was that? It was awesome. Was it scary at all? Um, you know, it, was, it wasn't It was scary, but there was a certain point where I was actually making a crossing from the upper Chesapeake where I had my boat around Galesville, around Annapolis area. And it was October. It was October 26th. Mm-hmm. And it was freezing cold. And I was crossing the Chesapeake. And I almost had hypothermia because I was on deck and it was it, the waves were really big. I mean, I grew up sailing on, you know, the in Norfolk, you're, you sail on the, you're exposed to the Atlantic. So I, I'm used to big weather. Right. But being by yourself, it never really occurred to me because it's so familiar, you know, right. that, hey, you could, something Die. could happen. My, <laughs> yeah, my friends are all like, you need a tow line. And I was like, what? They said, you need to drag a line because if you come off, 
you know, the idea is that the boat keeps sailing, especially if you have an autopilot. So you grab on and get towed and hopefully pull yourself back up, which oh, I yeah. can't imagine the strength that would take. I said, no, we don't do it that way. Hmm. I said, you just don't fall off the boat. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is not an option. And how old were you when you did this thousand mile journey? Um, I was 29 going on 30. In fact, I did it to celebrate my 30th birthday. Uh huh. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. And you just said, I'm going to I'm going to do this to show myself that I've made it. Yeah, well, it's a little bit um, less. It was a little bit less. Um, I don't know. It was kind of a little more casual than that. I had bought a boat and I was actually out. It was actually on a dry dock and I was waxing the hull and a friend came by and says, started telling me a story about how I'd gone down the intercoastal waterway and and done some things there. And by the time he got done with the story, this mm -hmm. is how I was. I was so spontaneous. I just said, well, I'll do that. I'm going to do that. And it was like in a matter of moments, he'd convinced me. And, and I just took off and did it. And in fact, I had no real plan. People were saying I had this tiny boat. In fact, it wasn't just like a voyage. It was a voyage on a very small boat. It was a 24-foot boat. Yeah. And everyone <laughs> says, well, you need an autopilot. Well, I grew up old school. We didn't use any of that electronic stuff, GPS. Someone right. wanted to give me GPS. I said, well, I'm going to throw that overboard because I don't need that. I can <laughs> navigate. Oh, my God. But I was I was glad I had it in the end. That's a long trip. I was literally, you know, I was getting up early in the morning, pulling anchor and heading out in the cold. And um, it was very physical. Yeah, how, and how long did it take you? Started in October? Yes, October 20, 26th. And I followed the trail of like going down the intercoastal waterway is there's like the snowbirds going. It's probably like here in Arizona. Yeah, people come, they go south. So I was kind of in that wagon train, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> but in this case, boat, boat train of doing that. And um, yeah, I, I took a long time, actually, because even though I was traversing great distances, I'd stay in ports and at that age, I'd party. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it took me a month or so. It wouldn't necessarily <laughs> take that long, but I remember I sp my thirtieth birthday in Jekyll, where I wanted to make it to at least Jekyll, where it started getting warmer. So when I wore, when I got up in the morning, there wasn't frost on the deck. Right. You know, where I could slide right. off, <laughs> and I was at the Jekyll Island. I think it was a the the. It was like the Yacht Club, and my birthday's around Thanksgiving. So I had Thanksgiving, celebrated my 30th birthday with a bunch of friends down there. It was awesome. And have you ever considered doing that again? Um, Sailing? Yeah, by yourself or doing something like that. Yeah. Um, yes and no. I mean, I still sail somewhat. I don't own boats now, but I have in recent history chartered so i was like um so i can charter boats the last time i did a sail was in belize mm. i was with people and then i was in um the british virgin islands chartered a 41 foot beneteau and sailed around but my passion right now really is horses and if i thought about doing a, a big traverse it would be some fantasy of i don't know taking a horse packing you know up and, and going a large distance on a horse maybe like endurance riding mm. kind of thing yeah okay we're learning that's why, that's we're why, learning a lot about you already that's why i'm here <laughs> <laughs> for the for horses yeah well partially here meaning tucson well meaning meaning the west oh yeah okay we're gonna get know. to that i'm still not done with the boat part because it's pretty fascinating <laughs> <laughs> I still want to delve a little bit more into that. So what did your dad do and mom do as a profession? Yeah. Um, my dad worked for a company. It was back in the old days. It's called Flowers Baking Company. And back in those days, you work for a company your whole life. You know, yeah, you're right. company loyal. So it was a Flowers Baking Company. They made white bread. Mm -hmm. And he was the fleet superintendent. So we moved to Virginia and he managed kind of the eastern fleet of retail i guess they were like route trucks is what they called them mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. he managed that until he retired yeah so he had a stable a really stable job he just loved boats oh yeah totally yeah and my mom actually my mom was a horticulturist and she worked uh, for for a long most of my life she worked for golf courses so she was a landscape designer and horticulturist for mm. Um, a lot of Jack Nicholas's courses, oh, yeah. actually. And, and in fact, um, she did um, some courses that had the PGA tournament. So mm -hmm. she's been in, her work was in magazines. She was super, super creative. Yeah, I was going to say that's where your creative bent come. So she did like landscape architecture kind of things with it. And she did she work with Jack? Yeah, I don't know if she she didn't work with Jack directly, but I think that what was said is he, she was so good that she had a job at any of his courses. Oh, wow. 
Mm-hmm. How did she get into that? Well, um, my mom, well, I was born in Seoul, South Korea. Uh-huh. My mother's Korean. Uh-huh. And when she came to the United States, you know, Koreans are big entrepreneurial people. Yes, very much. Especially the women. So she just tried to find, as she was learning to speak English, which is at the same time I was learning to speak. I was yes. a baby. She just took up an interest. She, we actually farmed. She had a farm, or we had a farm, and she grew crops. <laughs> My mom, mm-hmm. <laughs> I know, and had some greenhouses in the backyard. So she liked growing things, and we determined that she liked growing things, and that's kind of the area of expertise that she chose to to be in. I don't know what her background was prior to that in Korea about doing that because she just started growing things. Yeah. In fact, at one point, she was growing like corn and okra, and she was selling the crops to Campbell Soup Company. Uh-huh. So she started doing that. Then she got into flowers and plants. We had these huge greenhouses in our backyard. I grew up with plants and flowers. And I remember vaguely butterflies and uh, all kinds of, uh, what do you call it? We had little plants. I remember once we had a plant and I was just a toddler, you know, and had these wonderful like little red and green things on them. I had to touch them and then touch my eyes. Yep. You know what that Chilled was? peppers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she was growing <laughs> yeah. pepper plants, the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. But she made a jump from from that because we we lived in South Georgia at that time. And then we ended up, my dad took a job in Virginia, was what moved us to Virginia. And my mom couldn't have, I guess, you know, in that area of having land to do um, wholesale flower business was kind of, it would be expensive. But mm-hmm. she got a job at Princess Anne Country Club. Mm. And that start kind of started it. And that was it. That was it. And she was great at it. And she didn't really have, like, a lot of people now that would do the same job would go get an, an, uh, an education in landscape architect. She just knew how to do it. She was just good She would hand draw it in the old days and she'd plan wow. out beds. They said that she did the the work. They tried to price her out once and, and see if they could contract it. They said, <laughs> this small woman did the work of five grown men. <laughs> <laughs> so she was very creative. And so were you creative as a child with drawing or sculpture or that kind of thing? Uh, yes. I basically, um, I started drawing and painting at a very young age. My grandfather was my major influence. He... He introduced me to painting, actually. Um, this is on your father's side? Yeah, my father's yeah. side, yeah. Um, he himself was a kind of a tinkerer. He came back from, he was a, um, an, what's equivalent to a Navy SEAL when he was in World War II and Korean mm. War. And he had a furniture business. So he built furniture mm-hmm. and he also painted signs. He kind of all around tinkerer. And he introduced me to those paint by number sets were really yeah. popular when yeah, I was sure. a kid. And yeah. I remember he just kind of brought some over and it was oil paint. <laughs> yeah. I feel like a ta- kid, a toddler. Right. He opens it up and he says, this is what, you know, how to do it. And I right. remember the smell of oil paint hitting me like four or five years old. Yeah. And I remember that was just it. And also me. associated with your grandfather too, which yes. is nice. Yes, he was my he's my he was my favorite. See, person. Yeah, there you go. So, do you still get that feel when you smell the oil? I do. Yeah, how wonderful is that? It never it never changed. Oh yeah, that's fantastic. So, so you started doing paint by numbers because he brought them in, and you were how old were you? Five, six? Yeah, five or six. Yeah. And you know, at that time, do you really paint in the lines? Probably not. I remember taking the paint that I would do paint by number and starting to paint with it, just mm. like on yeah. the side, just right. using the paint. I said, I don't need this thing. Right. We'll yeah, just I'm do sure this. I can see that of you. Yeah. And my grandfather taught me penmanship. I mean, he really believed in, you know, um, we did sign painting and he, he would t- say things to me like, you know, if you can do this well, you'll always have a job. You'll mm. always be okay. Yeah. He never, you know, he, he died 30 years ago and he never lived to see the era of the computer and right. what has been taken, you know, sign painting is not done by hand anymore. Right. But I was taught to do it. And we did um, also what's called toll painting. I don't know what that it's is. It's like T-O-L-L-E, tulp. It's kind of like doing motifs on furniture was popular in the 70s. Yes. 70s and 80s. So yes. I was taught to do that and I sold my first... I would say my first work because I painted on little chairs that he made. He made these tiny little chairs and we'd paint these motifs, you know, with strawberries yeah. and mushrooms and I know uh, um, violets were yeah. very popular. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I would hand paint them and he would sell them. And did you get a little bit of the profit once it's sold? I think I did. Or yeah. they fed me, you know, yeah. uh-huh. <laughs> child labor. And how old were you then? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was probably, I remember 
maybe earlier, but at least eight years old or yeah. so I was doing that. Yeah, so he was probably an interesting man. And you go through World War II and Korea as that. He saw some action and things. He saw a lot of stuff. He did. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't really like to talk about I'm it. He sure was a not. very peaceful person, mm. actually. I found out later in life what he had done. Yeah. And, I, and, and the name of service. And it was shocking to believe that was the same person. Uh, had he been in some of these major wars? that uh, major battles in World War II? Yeah, or was my it... grandfather was um, what they call a, um, was under, it's just a Navy swimmers or under, it's called demolition team. Oh but, yeah, demolition. Which m m is now Navy SEAL. Yeah. So he, technically he was a Navy SEAL. Yeah. So the battle at Iwo Jima, yes. you know, the, the raising of the flags and the Marines go ashore and they raise that flag and it's very like kind of seminal experience. Yes that his team had gone ashore the night before, swam. That's why they're called the Navy swimmers. They would swim right. from the boats ashore and they took over the beach and cleared it so that the the, the Marines, Marines could arrive. Marines could come in, yeah. And when I found out how they cleared the beach, it was kind of shocking. Yeah. You know, because they killed everyone. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of my friends, close friends, Charlie, a shout out to you. His father was <laughs> at that battle wow. when they raised the flag. Yeah. So that's really seminal. Those are seminal things. So that affected your father in ways too. He must have been a structured man and a, <laughs> right? Am I hitting it? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I never thought about it like yeah. that. But yeah, my dad, my dad was also in the military. Uh -huh. He went into the army. And so, yeah, he was very structured. In fact, we sometimes, I love my dad, and but we'd be at odds because I'm not a very structured right. person. We yeah. had kind of the opposite personality. I can see that. Yeah. yeah, he would say, I sometimes he would say, uh, we have to do this like this. And I'd say, well, why, why? And that would just like, you know, was yeah. a little much. Huh. <laughs> it was like, because we just do it that way. Right. Okay. <laughs> was he in Vietnam? He must have been close to it. Um, he would have been in Vietnam, but he actually ended up in Korea. So he, and rather than being drafted, he enlisted. Yes. So some of the young men from families that were kind of connected would find out that they would probably be going to Vietnam and they warned the families. So he went ahead and enlisted and yeah. he ended up in Korea. He was a tank mechanic. And Korea. that's where he met your mom? That's right. Yeah. See, I'm putting all these pieces together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he fell in love with her. Yeah. Or she fell in love with him, one of the two. Oh, I think, both. I think it was mutual. I used to ask them, I said, how is it that you didn't speak the same language, but you created and quite fell in love. Yeah. And, you know, when you're a young person, you don't get that, you know? Yeah. And he says, I said, how did you know? He goes, you just know. Yeah, you do. I think that's right. Yeah. Well, as an adult, I, I yeah. get how that happens. But <laughs> as a kid, it just couldn't yeah. put my head around right. it. <laughs> that's interesting. So when you're growing up, you're creative, you're working with your grandfather, you're doing these paintings on furniture. At what point do you go, maybe this is a career? Were you at that point? Like, I might want to go to college and do this kind of stuff or... Mm -hmm. Or what happened at that point? Yeah. Well, when I was working with my grandfather, when I was very young, I say four or five years old, someone came along and says, my, aren't you a good little artist? And I didn't even know what the word artist meant, but I knew that it had something to do with that big drawing I yes, was doing. And right. I and I never looked back. So when people, you know, back in my day, people would say, what do you want to do when you grow up? That was right. like standard answer. I just repeat back artist, right. artist. And right. I, I really couldn't. I really have never kind of had a segue where I chose another career. It's always been a clear, clear career path for me. And it, it's not really a career. It's like a lifestyle. It's just that's who I was. Mm. And so when you graduated from high school, did you go to college? I didn't go to college right away. In fact, I was exhibiting at artists even before I left high school. I started doing like local shows. And oh, when yeah. I got you're, a, so you were making art at that time. And these were oil paintings? Yeah, um, oil paintings. But at that time, I did all kinds of different things. I did, I, I remember doing acrylic paintings, uh, well, like kind of on paper. Actually, I did a lot of like kind of colored ink. Mm was what I was doing more of. And I, I, I did some oil painting, lots and lots of drawing. I was, in Virginia, I was very fortunate because um, they have a very good system for uh, magnet school system. Mm. In fact, I was in the first magnet school, governor's, uh, it's called the Governor's Magnet School for the Arts. I, I was in the pilot program for the United States. I was in the first graduating class. Wow. So when I went to high school, I left at 11 o'clock and I went to, we didn't have a actual facility yet since we were a pilot program. So I went to, I just drove to Old Dominion University 
And I went to school. I went to art school the rest of the day, all through high school from ninth grade up. On wow. Saturdays, I went to another program, and this is a shout out to the Hermitage Foundation there in Hampton Roads and in, in, um, Hampton area. It's a museum. It's mm-hmm. kind of a, a, I think it's a small foundation museum. Mm-hmm. And they had a Saturday program working with students um, that were handpicked from all over the school districts. And we worked with an art, a professional artist. So I had a lot of mentors and people along the way that I worked. I have very untraditional training in art because I was already, and then and then from there I had the confidence because I graduated from high school and I got a separate graduation from that art school that I had the confidence to just. Yeah, you knew you were it. I was there. Because you found your gift, you knew what it was and you plowed right into it right off the bat. So you were training for four years in high school right. to be an artist, right. like really training. Yeah. Wow. Do they still have that program? They do. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's ex- <clears throat> excuse me. It's expanded to um, include, I think, dance and performance art as well. It's a big program. And did um, you have to apply to, I mean, clearly you had to apply, but did they do some kind of criteria to, yeah. to get you? I was, uh, my high school art teachers kind of took me under their wing and they kind of, I believe they kind of like put the word in, got you know, it. they kind of made sure I got these opportunities because I really saw something. And yeah. And your dad and mom are okay with you going to an art high school? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I see. What does they, that they, mean? They, yeah. well, it, it, well, actually, I ended up leaving home when I was 15 years old and living on my own. Uh, so from 15 on, I lived alone on my own. And so we went separate ways. Yeah, got it. <laughs> So, yeah, so I, I did all that on my own. I had a car and I worked. And yeah, I wonder when you said I would drive to Dominion, I was thinking, how do you do that? Yeah, you yeah. had your own car. Yeah, I had my own car and I, I would work and, you know. So they came around to it at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my parents were probably, I think, if I remember correctly, they were kind of like, you'll be a great little graphic designer. And I was like, oh, no, yeah. oh, no, no. <laughs> well, I think, you know, and of course I don't know them, but just looking at their background, you know, now that I know it, I could see them going you need a job yes a job this is not a job and you're going to go to high school and just do art and not do a job mm-hmm. and not become you know someone who has a corporate you know life exactly yeah. i think they were afraid for me and they I'm sure and they didn't know what was going to happen to me and all those things that parents think about but yeah. i think it kind of blows their mind now when they yeah, see what, sure. what the work does yeah, I'm <laughs> where <sure>. I'm at. <laughs> so you did all that. You graduated and you were already selling art and mm-hmm. had a somewhat of a, you knew your career path. Mm-hmm. So what did you do from that point when you left high school? Oh, yeah. Let me just think back. That was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> well, I, we, we know you, what was, we did at 29 to 30. Yeah, I think I was, I, I was um, kind of distracted a little bit in my life. I'd moved back... Um, I moved from Virginia back down to Georgia, and I was with my grandparents, which I'm very grateful, actually, I didn't go right to college because I got to spend some time with them. Nice. And I didn't know at the time that my grandfather would die during that time period. Mm. And so um, I was very grateful to be there. And I think I took a side job, and I just did my art. And I was hanging out, probably doing what young people do, probably getting into some trouble and right. hanging out with some boys or whatever right. girls do at that age, right. <laughs> you know. But I was doing all the kind of local and regional shows. Uh huh. Were you doing abstract work at that time? No, I was actually doing. Um, I was doing portraits, right? Kind of, kind of. Yeah, they're kind of. I've always been kind of an expressionist, so kind of expressionist portrait work. Yeah, like neo expressionism. Kind of thing? Yeah, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Uh-huh. I wasn't quite into abstraction at that point. I was I hadn't made a break and um, that would come later. But I would paint I had I'd found palette knife painting, so that really intrigued me. So whatever I was painting, say if I was painting a portrait of you was done with this heavy impasto, right. like very uh, expressionist style, um, but naturalistic. So my training has been in classical realism, actually. Mm-hmm. And I was very interested in painting people. Mm. Was my primary was my primary subject at that time, and how long did that last? It lasted a good long while till I finally did. So we're going to fill in the pieces here. I did yeah, end fill up, it all in. Yeah, I, it all. I ended up going to college, 
you know, I had some friends say, hey, you know, it's a really good idea if you go to college because right. you'll you'll learn how to speak and read and write and, right. you know, do all the things that you right. need to present yourself. And it was a great idea. So I ended up um, I, I ended up in West Virginia. I know it's a big jump. South Georgia, West Virginia. Yeah. I met my ex-husband and um, we're big into backpacking and climbing and all things outdoors. So right. he got a job in West Virginia um, at Trust Joyce McMillan, a, a wood technology company. He was kind of the um, quality assurance director mm -hmm. there. And so anyway, that took me to West Virginia, long story. But um, I bought a farm there. And since I was there, I thought, what will I do with myself besides paint in my studio? I had a studio there as I decided to go get an education finally. Mm. So I went to West Virginia Wesleyan College. And um, at that time, let's just see how this goes a little bit. A lot of stuff happened there. Um, it's a small liberal arts college, you know, a great, a great style of education because you're really getting like the, the, the literature and all of those things. I love to read. I'm a big mm -hmm. reader and I like history too. So I, have, I can delve into my other subjects, which kind of fi put fire to the imagery that I'm creating. And I think if I think about it, along those times, I start becoming interested in some people's work like... Uh, George Baselitz, for example, was a big influence on my life because I actually, I think I had an inclination toward abstraction, mm -hmm. and but I didn't know how to get there being kind of a realist. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of an, a realist, but with kind of a real expressionist bent. But I remember I wanted to push it. So I remember at one point taking some of George Baselitz's images, so he turns upside down, and then, then it looks like he's kind of deconstructing the image. I figured out a way to take my paintings, and what I did was take, I would paint a painting, and then I'd paint a painting of that painting, and then I'd paint a painting of that painting, mm -hmm. until finally I deconstructed the image. Mm. So I taught myself how to abstract form. And it really um, influenced me um, because I was able to do that. And I was just looking at a lot of artists in the East, I was influenced by. Uh, Were you getting a BFA at this time at school? It's a, a well, the degree would be BA because it's a Bachelor of Arts, so it's a liberal arts. We don't have BFA. I got but, it. Okay. But yeah, I was working there, and I mostly just applied myself to painting. I was just kind of the, I don't know what I was. I they they actually relegated me to the basement. I don't have a great. I have to say, uh, I there's a lot of good people there, but I didn't take too well to some aspects of going to college so they them really get them telling you what to do i know they really getting me to the basement and i was kind of like the troll in the basement yeah. and i was down there and um, for four years yeah i had like a big studio down there and occasionally people would come down and if uh -huh. you're lucky i didn't throw something at you because <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. i was busy working yeah making. i was working something out in myself yeah and i during that time i also learned uh, printmaking which is a, a, a really important part of kind of my development I think because I later would own a, a press and do a lot of mono printing, which further kind of helped me loosen up. Yeah, it definitely will. You know, just loosen up and, and kind of find that immediacy in my work. Um, do I you just, still use those? Do you still do mono prints and stuff? I don't do a lot of mono printing just because um, I like doing it, but I just... I, I, I I'm just I'm just I've got so many paintings in my head. I don't got even it. I don't even know if I'm going to live long enough to paint all the ones right. I have. In you my won't. Head. <laughs> it doesn't matter how long you live. You I, won't. I yeah. know, right? Yeah. No, you can't. It's impossible. That's part of the creative being. You just yeah. And it comes out, and you do what you can do, and it's going to go out until the very end, and then you'll be like, wow, there was still a lot more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so exactly. you just it's how it is. <laughs> yeah. So you finish your college. You're in West Virginia on a with a farm. Your farm. Mm -hmm. And you must have, was that when you got involved with horses at that point? No, not at, not at that point, although I would have loved it. But um, actually, so my husband and I, we divorced and he left and I stayed. So I stayed in West Virginia for 13 years. Mm. And I moved from my farm to in town. So I had a studio in downtown. What, like What city was this? Buchanan. Okay. And it was kind of crazy because it was a small town. It's kind of not unlike towns here in the West, mm. actually. You know, I realized the facades of some of these buildings that are here actually right. came from the East. Yeah. You know, they brought them out, the facades. Right. So I worked in this upstairs studio that was a dress shop in the night. I think it was like 1912 called the, I think it was called the Watson's Dress Shop. Mm -hmm. And it had hardwood floors. I think it was like 1,200 feet, uh, square feet or whatever. It was right. huge. It was a dance studio at one point. It had a big 
big um, mirror on the far end, and I was in heaven because yeah. I had I had five glorious windows, and I could stand at the window, look down at Main Street, watch people going by, and I got the apartment across the street. Oh yeah. So I used to say I could have a zip line; I could just go back and forth yeah. to work. There was a bookstore. Uh-huh. There was a coffee shop uh-huh. and there was a bar. What else could you need? So <laughs> I had, I got done with what I needed. I'm surprised you ever left that place. I know, right? It, yeah. was, it was pretty darn good. Yeah, it seems like you're pretty happy there. Yeah, it was a beautiful place. And you can paint big because you have a big studio, right? Yeah, I painted some of the biggest paintings I've ever painted yeah. in that space. And um, I should mention at that time, I started showing in Washington, D.C. Mm. with a dealer by the name of Norman Parrish at Parrish Gallery in Georgetown. They're still around? No, Norman died, gosh, how long is, maybe a decade or so mm. ago. It was heartbreaking. He was a good, he was my first run with a real dealer, and yeah. it was a great relationship. Oh, yeah, that's and, nice. That's nice when you can find those. They're not always that way, unfortunately. Yeah. But Well, I've had good experiences. Yeah. I just trust my instincts. So. Well, that's important. Yeah. So I was very fortunate. And how did you find Norman? <laughs> oh, it was very interesting. Um, back in the day, this is a day where you kind of walk around and you have your slides or your portfolio under your arm, yeah. kind of thing. I, they still do that, by the way. They're just they not. Do? Yeah, they're just not slides, but they okay. still do. They trust still me. Do. Uh. Yeah. So I kind of did a, what you're not supposed to do. I did cold call and mm-hmm. I walked around. I remember I was in D.C. Someone encouraged me to do it, and I had a little portfolio of actually were mono prints to kind of give an idea of what my paintings are right. like. And what I did was I would go into a gallery and. People would actually give me some time, and I was respectful. Of course, you don't go when it's busy or whatever. And I'd talk to the person. They say, "Well, this is really nice work. Wait, well, this is nice work, yeah. but we don't represent that kind of work. Look around. But right. we will send you. You should go here." So when right. I walked into the next gallery, I'd say, "Well, so and so sent me." Right. 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 And finally, when I walked into Parish Gallery, I'll never forget because he was uh, Norman. <laughs> I can't yeah. say enough about him. Yeah. He was the first African American dealer in. Um, in Washington, D.C. The story was he was a painter and yeah. couldn't find a place to show. So he said, screw it, I'm going to open my own. He owned his own gallery and he was super respected. And, yeah, nice. and, and, and he was like, a, he had a booming voice like um, Morgan Freeman, oh, you yeah. know, and he says, welcome. And he was always playing jazz. Yeah. You know, just a wonderful personality. Yeah. And I walked in, you know, with my little stuff and he says, well, come here, let me see what you have. Right. And it was just like, that it was a connection it yeah was a he, really... and he liked it and saw it that yeah. can happen that's happened to me before yeah yeah so the good dealers take a look yeah you know, <laughs> on many levels right mm-hmm. one is because they should just for self-preservation you know mm-hmm. that's how you can find some people but two there's a there should be a respect there that, that you got to do your own you got to help the people that are making this as their life which is a tough life yeah. for most of them Aww. so you take a look even if you don't want to take a look sometimes, <laughs> you know, and then say, yeah, go down to the next guy. Yeah. <laughs> or you give some, you know, I never, I always try to give some kind of positive, uh, sometimes you can call it criticism, but some kind of positive something. Hmm. So, because if you're brave enough to walk in with your portfolio, you know, you, you deserve to get something, you right. know, even if you may not be able to show in this gallery or maybe you're not even ready, at least, you know, you're taking it seriously enough. Mm. So you are doing that. Norman saw it. Whack, there you are. And then that run lasted for how long, you guys? Oh, it was about, I think about 15 years. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Yeah. And so that gave you the ability to make some more money, Mm -hmm. right? Because he could sell the stuff. And so you painted and you lived in West Virginia with the bar down the way and the coffee (laughs) shop on the other side and your apartment across the street. And so why did you leave West Virginia? Well, I'd been there, like I mentioned, I was in West Virginia about 13 years, and I, oh, that's a story. Let's see. Do that's I wanna, what this is about. I know. It's like, well, it's like, do I want to tell it? Yeah. Uh, how huh. do I say it? Huh. I, well, I, I should back up and mention that um, in that time period, I began practicing Zen, which is interesting because Zen meditation yes. and Zen meditation doesn't seem like West Virginia and Zen meditation really go together. But there was no, a, <laughs> I no, they do. But there was a. I've been to West Virginia. I spent time oh, in West Virginia. Oh, you have. Uh huh. Okay. I did the National Youth Science Camp in West Virginia. Oh, so you know. Yeah, okay. it's a very Zen place. It's a fabulous. Yeah. Place actually, contrary to what the media likes to. Oh yeah, no, it's wonderful. So there was a visiting Zen teacher that had started coming there, and I started practicing. And I've been pra- actually I've been practicing now for about 22 years, but my teacher comes from France, and I remember one day 
we're sitting in it, believe it or not, as a Chinese restaurant that I would go to. Uh (laughs) And it was like, I had the same routine every day. And that's not going to go off that alarm. (laughs) (laughs) Do I turn it off? (laughs) No, keep going. Okay. Um, I would uh, go. So you left your phone on, huh? I did. Can I turn it (laughs) off? Yeah, turn it off. I'm sorry. (laughs) You're going to have to edit this part. No, this is definitely not being edited. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, you can answer it if you actually, want. Actually, you know what it is? It's not It's not a phone call. It's, it's Oh, it's an alarm to get up? It's an alarm. <laughs> it's an alarm of some kind. Yeah, okay. <laughs> maybe that's supposed to meet with you. To med- to meditate, maybe. Yeah. So you're doing, so you met this teacher. Yeah. So we were, to kind of back up, we were, we were at this Chinese restaurant in right. West Virginia on a street corner. You know, I live there and the street corner is very familiar to me. I'm in this Chinese restaurant every day eating fried rice or whatever I can do as an artist. And he sits with me and he's from France and he travels around the world teaching. And he, sa- he looked at me and he says, why are you still here? And he must have just said it at the right time mm. because it hit me. Mm. And I, at that time, it was kind of like a novel or something. I looked out this bay window at this desolate street and I said, I gave him a really on- honest answer. It was kind of like, I'm hiding. Mm. That is very honest. Yeah. And I don't know what from. Yeah. And it's kind of ironic since I've traveled all over the world. But yeah. in a weird way, in my home life, I was hiding or something. And and I think what happened was that if I look back, hiding might not have been the, the correct, the, the actual thing is like, I think I spent a long time in West Virginia to actually grow up. Mm. I felt like I grew up there. It was safe, probably. That's just it. It was yeah. safe. That was the, the, the answer. Because... I felt like I grew up as an adult. Mm-hmm. In my adult life, I grew up because I was largely on my own and had a very self-made life. And but I was done, and I didn't realize it till he asked me that question. And mm. when he said that, I never, I could never look back. I knew I was leaving. <laughs> it's like when you took your trip down the thousand miles, <laughs> right? It hit at the right time. Yeah. And so, did you work with him at that point? What happened? That's pretty interesting. Well, it, it, it was so simultaneous of all that, the, the, the time I spent in West Virginia painting, I also took up rock climbing. So it was climbing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a rock there called Cynic Rocks, and it's a great climbing area. And I started trad climbing, traditional climbing. Mm-hmm. And so fellas came out, fella came out from um, Utah that had a family in west virginia that he had moved west basically and he came back to visit his family and i hooked up with him and said oh i want to you know are the good climbers go west right right so i decided i'm going to go check it out so i went to utah and checked out around um salt lake area and it was great climbing and i just came back and told everybody i knew after all this time i said i'm leaving right i packed it all up yeah how, I didn't, how old were you at that point Oh boy. Um, Approximately. How, well, I'm 51 now. So that was in 2005. So that's six, 16 years ago. Mm-hmm. Okay, in the mid 30s, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, mid 30s. And so I packed up my studio. I gave away a lot of stuff and sold. I mean, I some of the paintings just went bye bye and all that. I dissolved a huge studio and. Um, Got my, I, I downsized all my possessions to what would fit in the back of my Subaru and a few boxes that I sent. I literally mm. had, I just wanted to completely change. Right. And I drove, I drove to Utah. And how long did you stay in Utah? Wow. And were you painting then or did you, or did you just do climbing? I mean, cause climbing can be all consuming. I used to climb, so it can become a. It- <laughs>
We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.